day one, BCF East. It is freaking muddy out here. Mud bog, baby, Mud right bogs. there. It's Woodstock 94 out here. You cannot put another thing. This Look at this. B-dub. All right. Packed, stacked, racked. Whoa. Ooh. Oh, that looks like a 1084. Front seat two. <laughs> It's raining. Raining. It's pouring. The pouring. old man's The old man, yeah, BCF he is storing. BCF 2017. 2017. Woo. Meet me in the mud. Your meditation. Ah! Woo! Can't forget our butt pads. Here we have the Commodore Mega Exhibit. And to have a Mega Exhibit on Commodore, you have to take it all the way back to the beginning. And in the beginning, Commodore made these typewriters. They bought a company in Germany that produced these. So this is an early model. It actually only has the Commodore name on the back and it's only like a decal. Later, Commodore was actually putting their names on the front. This is Commodore 2000. This was late 1960s. It's got the memory of about 4,400 sheets per 30 inch file cabinet drawer. It's got a speed of 149 words per minute if you can type that fast. And it, the video capabilities of this typewriter are about 3,000 to 4,000 characters per sheet. So then, after typewriters, Commodore came out with these. These were high technology of the day. These are adding machines. Here we have one still in the bag. This is something an accountant would have uh, basically taken to work at a at a company that they had to do the books for. Then, later on, Commodore came out with these. And these are electronic calculators. This actually started the whole ball rolling. It's because of these calculators and because of Texas Instruments getting into a price war with Commodore that Commodore decided to buy Moss Technologies, the producer of the 6502, which gave them the chip to later create the computers. Hi, I'm uh, Todd George. Uh, you may know me from the Chicken Lips Radio Podcast. We are a podcast about Commodore computers in general. Uh, we talk about the whole thing, the whole Commodore, everything about it, all the hardware, all the software, anything that we want to talk about, we talk about it. We have some Commodore here today. I don't know if you guys have seen. This is a Kim 1. When Moss introduced the uh, 6502 processor, they wanted something that they could use it on. They wanted a board that they could demo the features and capabilities and get people used to the programming languages and the opcodes and things like that, that that you could use to take advantage of the power of the 6502. Um, so this was an early attempt at uh, showing that off. And uh, right now you can see the one we have here is running a uh, clock, um, just a simple script that I found online. But yeah, the Kim 1, very early board, um, kind of their entry into the computing market. Moving on, we have the uh, original Commodore PET 2001. The uh, PET is based around the 6502 processor again. Commodore did a lot of vertical integration to save money. Um, one of the things they owned was a business machine and business product uh, company. And one of the things they made were filing cabinets. So they were trying to figure out, you know, hey, we have these really cool chips that we got from Moss, and we want to do something interesting with them. They're talking about doing maybe games, or, you know, do we do a personal computer? And one of the things they thought about was, hey, we've got a, com uh, a company that can maybe make us these cases, you know? So they made these metal cases from essentially the same, same parts that were filing cabinet parts. Um, they had a calculator company, which uh, you may have seen some of those in some of the other Guru Meditation videos. The keyboard was directly off of either a calculator or a cash register, so that's why it's so weird and square and things like that. 
Um, they built in a tape drive. One of the interesting parts was a lot of the other companies struggled with tape quality. The drives just didn't work that well. On the Commodore, it actually worked really well. Um, it stores digitally on the tape. It doesn't use analog, um, and it's direct access. It's uh, directly connected to the board, not using audio protocols and stuff. So it's a, it's a very reliable platform, um, and one of the more reliable vintage computing tape systems that was out there. We have uh, some of the later PEP models here. So what I've got is a 4032, and this one, they improved the keyboard dramatically. It's got a more typewriter style keyboard. Um, it's actually a very nice keyboard to type on. Um, it's got a 40 column video, which the original had. They upgraded the monitor to a 12 inch monitor instead of the nine inch in the original. You know, they started targeting two different markets. They were targeting education and entertainment uh, markets, you know, maybe like some sort of possibly home user stuff. They also uh, had business models. This is, happens to be the education keyboard. The one big thing that changed uh, was the education models had the Petsky uh, graphics on them. Uh, the other business style did not. And the business style would have you know, your standard uppercase, lowercase, where this, this one did the pet ski and uppercase. So we've got a bunch of accessories that go with the pets as well. Some of the uh, 4040 floppy drives. This is a standard, um, standard density uh, drive. Then we have this one here, which is like an extended density. Stores um, almost a megabyte per disk. We've also got parallel port uh, connectable um, 1541 style drive. This was a little later on, um, but it is running the parallel port that the uh, IEEE 488 that the pets run. This is the 8032. This is an 80 column unit. Um, right now we've got it open so that you can see the board inside. Um, you can see the linear power supply in the back, capacitor, um, and the actual board. We've also got one of the uh, Commodore PET uh, tractor feed printers. This is the 8023P. Why buy just a video game from Atari or Intellivision? Invest in the wonder computer of the 1980s for under $300, the Commodore VIC-20. Unlike games, it has a real computer keyboard. With the Commodore VIC-20, the whole family can learn computing at home. Plays great games, too. Under $300, the wonder computer of the 1980s, the Commodore VIC-20. Coming soon, Commodore brings you Gorf, the wonder arcade game, and Omega Race in home versions, Commodore. My name is Chris Falla. I love vintage computers, specifically Commodore. Uh, when I was a kid, I had a Commodore VIC-20, so that's my favorite. The Commodore VIC-20 was released in 1981. That would be after the PET and before the Commodore 64. One of the most important things about the VIC-20 is that it was the first computer to ever sell a million units. It was also the least expensive color computer. It was only about $300. So that was one of the reasons that, that led to its popularity. Funny thing about the VIC-20 is that it was selling really, really well, and Commodore built the 64 to outsell itself. Even though the VIC was already still selling, they knew they had to stay ahead of the market, and they already had the next product in the works to, to kill their own sales with something better. Rather than compare personal computers ourselves, we asked the computers which one was better on the basis of price and memory. The Apple II preferred the Commodore 64. Then we asked the IBM, and it picked the Commodore 64. Then the Radio Shack chose the Commodore 64. That's what we like about our competition. They're so honest. The Commodore 64, what nobody else can give you at twice the price. That went on to be, still to this day, the highest selling of any single model computer, and numbers I've heard are up in the 17 million range, at, you know, maybe, maybe more. One of the first ones had this silver label on it, and then the one that most people are comfortable, or f familiar with is the, with the rainbow label, Commodore 64. So the, the Commodore 64C, you know, the Commodore 64 is just so popular, they just kept selling them. In fact, they canceled production at least two different times and had to restart production. So one of the things they did to keep things moving is they lowered the cost of the, you know, the manufacturing and they, so they changed the case style, which is this style right here with the flatter, you know, shallow uh, keyboard. So after the Commodore 64 started gaining popularity, they made a portable version of it. It's, it was a very popular portable computer. It had a built-in CRT screen, a built-in floppy drive, and a detachable keyboard. 
and it was exactly compatible with the Commodore 64. So you could run all the same software. You even had a cartridge slot in the top where you could plug your cartridges in. Um, so it's another variation of the Commodore 64. I'm Rob Clark. I've uh, come here to uh, VCF this year from Switzerland. As you may tell from the accent, I'm British. But uh, yeah, uh, Switzerland is my home. First thing I bought was this, which is uh, Commodore 116. And um, this is part of the, what was known as the 264 series of machines. The original vision for the 264 was actually this machine here, which was meant to compete with the likes of Sinclair. At this point in time, the 64 was already selling millions, but the VIC-20, which I had here, is, uh, was coming to end of line. And Shiraz Shivji, the lead engineer at Commodore, came to people like Bill Hurd and said, we want something that's gonna be a spectrum killer, that's gonna grab the low end of the market, that's gonna uh, uh, replace the VIC-20. And this was basically the original vision of what, what that machine was. What basically happened, though, is um, this was about the same time as Jack Trammell uh, left Commodore and uh, the management that replaced him didn't quite have the same focused vision that Jack had so at that point the whole model range exploded and before you knew it they basically taken the C1, the, the, the TED architecture built in a bunch of extra software, word processor and such like give it a much bigger funky keyboard and all of a sudden you've got, although it's a great machine in its own right it was then selling alongside the 64 for about the same price. They then were going to sell another version of the machine, the 264, which is identical to this but doesn't have the software in it. They also released that we're going to sell a 232, which was a 32K version of this. Um, because they had spare keyboard mechanisms and everything, they also took that architecture, dropped it in here, gave it the same case design as the 64 and VIC and called it a C16. And there was also then going to be another one above that that had a built-in speech synthesizer. So before you knew it, you had about seven, eight models and they kind of lost the focus of what the machine was actually trying to be. So um, the 116, the thing was the original target of that only ended up selling in Germany. Uh, Rob, is this, is this the Porsche machine over here? Oh dear. The Porsche machine, right, no, no, it most definitely isn't, right? This machine here is, um, depending on whether you're from the US or Europe, is either known as the B128 in uh, the US or the C610 in Europe. Basically, this machine um, was gonna, the, the, it was, was basically Commodore's business machine, right? This was gonna follow on from the PET series. It was developed at around about the same time as the 64. It even has a SID chip in it, the same as the 64, but the, the processor is a derivation of the 6502, known as the 6509, that can address up to about a megabyte of memory. There was a story that Commodore had spoken to Porsche about being able to design a case for them. That never happened. Commodore did not ever have anything designed by Porsche. This machine here is a beautiful looking machine, but it was designed by a guy called Ira Velinsky, who was uh, ba uh, basically a, a, um, an industrial design guy that worked for Commodore. He was also the guy that designed the case for the Max machine. He was also the guy that designed the case for the Plus Four, and pretty much all of his machines look beautiful. But to clarify, Porsche had absolutely nothing to do with the design of that machine. Mm. Okay, so this is uh, known as the Commodore Max machine. The Max machine actually shares a lot of architecture with the 64, and this was being designed by Commodore Japan at the same time as, uh, as the 64. This was a games console, cartridge only, that was uh, only sold in Japan. The architecture is basically a subset of the 64. It was only ever cartridge based, and there was very few of the cartridges available. So, uh, unashamed plug here. You can buy a Multimax cartridge that's basically got every piece of software that was ever written for this. And they designed the 64 then to be able to use the cartridges that were done for this. The side effect of that was, known as the Ultimax mode on the 64, that's what was used to create, therefore, all of the freezer cartridges. So things like Ice Pick and such like, so the kids used to copy their games of their mates uh, back in the day, was as a direct result of having to keep the compatibility with this machine. So here we have Bill Hurd. Uh, not strictly an Amiga guy, but he did design one of my other favorite computers, the Commodore 128. That's, that actually, I am known as not the Amiga guy. That is my <laughs> official title. 
the, uh, though, though the guy that designed the case for the 128 designed the case for the Omega series, Min Yulong, so the semblance isn't accidental on that. I, I always actually did often wonder about that. Yeah. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, just about you know what your what, what is the, the process was going into designing the 128? Yeah, we we, we designed the 128 because they didn't stop us in time, right? So we uh, uh, we we came up with the concept of being C64 compatible and didn't tell management till it was too late to stop us. And then they thought it was their idea. And that compatibility was because of your experience with, with the, the TED the, machine. With the TED, right. And the TED was supposed to be the Plus 4 series. It was supposed to be a text display business computer for $79. It was supposed to be a Sinclair killer. And you know we'd already done the Apple killer and the Commodore 64. We didn't need to do a second one. However, when I was at the CES show, a woman showed me some educational software she had written and she said, I spent all, like, nine months writing this, and it won't run on your new machine. And it's like, oh, don't, don't, yeah. So when we decided to do the C64 mode in the 128, it was to sell more computers, but it was also a way to support the community that had supported us. So now, because we could do it, her software would run again on our newest computer. So that's, that's the way we looked at it, you know, because we did the whole 128 in five months. So, and, wow. you know, it, that's what it was really meant to do is there was this break in time before the Amiga would come out, and we needed something there to step onto to get up to the Amiga. We had to have something to show. Plus, if you're not done in January, you've already missed Christmas of that year because it's got to be on, on the pipeline by June to be on the shelves in time for Christmas. So the Amiga wasn't going to be ready in time, and so that's why we did it in five months. I got the final PC board in January that passed FCC, and we, you know, so that was its niche. Um, we did sell 5.7 million or something like that. So if you ask somebody from Commodore, that's more than the Apple II sold. If you ask somebody from Apple, they'll just tell you they're the best. So. <laughs> I guess the 128 was the first of the Commodore 8 bits to, to produce RGB directly. Yeah, I mean, we, we'd like to think we, we were trying to get the public used to 80 column, right? That's one of the, I mean, it's dual OS and all that, but it's like the 80 column era is here, right? That you can move off your TV set, you know, and that's that's what we, we thought. And there were monitors available, you know, so we, and we ourselves loved it. We'd have them both side by side. We, we use both screens. So we're also thinking, aha, uh -huh, gamers can like program the thing here on 80 column here. So right, we, it's kind of one of the first dual monitor computers yeah, out there. Yeah, I think so. So we called, or I call the, um, the 120, I call it nine pounds of poop in a five pound bag because I couldn't quite fit the 10th pound of poop. Right? <laughs> so it's as much poop as I could shove in a bag and still have it work in, in five months. Well, it's, it's three computers pretty much in it, one box. Yeah, in three OS's, yeah. 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 So, well, always great seeing you, always great talking to you. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, fun. Take care, guys. Experience the mind unbounded. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. So here we have the Amiga part of the exhibit, and here we have the Amiga 1000, the first Amiga that was produced by Commodore. 1985, this thing hit the market like an A bomb. 4,096 colors on the screen. This demo. People wanted this. You wanted this on your desk. The only problem with it, engineered as it was, keyboard garage, all these neat things, all these neat features, it was very expensive to produce. It made for a very expensive computer. So this was not a replacement for the 64 traditional things that Commodore sold to the home market. I am the Commodore Amiga 500 home computer. Dazzling animation at your command. I am the Commodore Amiga 500, a multitasking home office in your hand. I am the Commodore Amiga 500, total home video you control, and arcade quality games in stereo. 
And now, you can be everything I am. So here we have the Amiga 500 and its big box brother, the Amiga 2000. Big box meaning that it comes in a larger case and has expansion ports, but they both share the same Motorola 68000 CPU. Now, the Amiga 500 is near and dear to my heart. It was my first Amiga. It came out in 1987 and is the best selling Amiga of all time. Now, even though it was a very capable computer, it's most known for its awesome games. And here we have Lemmings up on the screen, which is one of my all time favorites. Okay, so here we have the Commodore 65. Take yourself back to 1990. The Amiga 500 has been out for almost three years. And you put into development an 8-bit computer. But this 8-bit computer is no slouch. This thing can display 256 colors in its low-res mode out of the palette of 4096. And we all know the number 4096 from ham mode. This thing has two SID chips in it for stereo sound. It has a built-in 3.5-inch floppy drive. It's basically the 1581 floppy drive from the earlier Commodore computers. And as you can see from this casework, it's at the point where it's almost nearly ready for production for consumer purchase. It's kind of crazy because in 92, you have the 1200 come out. So at the same time this is being developed, you know that that machine is being developed. It's much more capable. So at some point, Commodore decides to cancel this before it ever gets sold in a store. But the big question is, does it turn on? And we'll find that out right now. Sure does. And there you have it, the Commodore 65. Now, of course, since this was never released to the public, there's really no software development for it. They had sent this out to developers. In fact, this machine came from CMD. So all there really is for it is some demos and things that you can find on FTP sites. And I don't know if these were produced by people later on or if these were produced by Commodore who were getting ready to try to show this to stores and try to build up a market and sales of it, getting ready to sell it. This is such a rare piece of equipment. It's, a, it's the holy grail of Commodore collections. How'd you get it? Right, so as I said before, Commodore was sending these out to developers. Well, I got into contact with a 8-bit developer on Genie. CMD, they ran the Commodore section. Every now and then, our Amiga guys would flood in there just because we were bored. And uh, I got to talking to them about this machine. I had some parts. I didn't have a complete system. They had what they thought were non-working ones that Commodore had sent them to begin developing hardware and software for it. They would sell it to me, so they sold me one for $40. I got it home and it worked perfectly. So there you have it. So now 1990, we see the first real serious upgrade to the chipset on the Amiga. You had the 3000 and later on you had the 600 come out. These two machines used what was called the enhanced chipset, two megs of chip RAM now, gave enhanced graphics capabilities. This 3000 is more of a business machine. I'm showing it with the great game Worms, but this was more for business. It had a built-in flicker fixer. You could plug it into a VGA monitor, built-in hard drive controller. Everything you needed was right in this box. And it also could come with Amiga Unix for the education market. So here we have the Amiga 1200 and its big box brother, the Amiga 4000. Now these are AGA machines, Advanced Graphics Architecture Machines, which expand the capabilities of the OCS, the original chipset. So instead of displaying 4,096 colors on the screen at one time, it can display over 262,000 colors on the screen at one time, making gorgeous photorealistic images. So up here I have the classic Deluxe Paint 5 up uh, with an image that I took in Lublin, Poland while I was at Ami Party. And as you can see, the image is just gorgeous and extremely photorealistic. I just, I love working in this format. Here we have the CD32. It's Commodore's second foray into the home video game market. Boots off a CD, great graphics, great games. It's got a little bit weird looking controller, looks like a little bat, but basically inside this machine is an Amiga 1200 AGA chipset. And it's the first 32-bit game system to hit the market. They beat Nintendo, they beat Sega, they beat Atari with this. So here we are, post-Commodore bankruptcy era, and what we have is companies licensing the Commodore name to put the logo on things like media players, netbooks, and keyboards. So last and certainly not least in the long line of Commodore history, we have Amiga OS 4.1, the latest Amiga operating system. Now, it's running on a Pegasus machine. A Pegasus is an open source motherboard with a PowerPC processor. Now, being that it's a PowerPC processor, it can run Amiga OS 4.1 as well as Morph OS.
Wow, Bill, that was an awesome show and a great Commodore retrospective. We hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button and follow us on all social media. And we will see you on the next episode of The Guru Meditation.